Yali Madad, and welcome everyone. My name is Saba Dosani, and I will be moderating today's Fields of the Future speaker series, exploring careers in biomedical sciences. A little bit more about me, I'm currently a student at Texas A&M University, studying to hopefully become a nurse. I am also the College Station representative for AKEB. The Fields of the Future Speakers is hosted by Aga Khan Education Board with the aim of exploring career paths, innovation, and opportunities in selected fields of the future. As for today's edition, we will begin by reflecting on knowledge society and the purpose of education in Islam. At this time, I would like to invite Alian Giovanni, our Fields of the Future team member, to share this reflection. Yalim with everyone. Today's skill of the day is a twofer. The significance of staying curious and grappling with questions that challenge our belief systems and pre-existing ideologies. The mindset and desire to pursue new knowledge is the basis of scientific research and innovation. Researchers are consistently confounded with unexpected results that challenge their original hypothesis and preconceived notions about the subject. This often requires them to return to the drawing board and reconstruct their research design. However, often it is these unexpected outcomes that pave the way for deeper insights into the subject and require further questioning and investigation, thus paving the way for true innovation and discovery. In his Peterson lecture at the International Baccalaureate in Atlanta, in April 2008, His Highness emphasized that, like the great Muslim artists, philosophers, and scientists of centuries past, we must enthusiastically pursue knowledge on every hand, always ready to embrace a better understanding of Allah's creation, and always ready to harness this knowledge in improving the quality of life at all people. At the crux of biomedical scientific research and innovation lies a deep rooted passion to understand the world all around us and wield that knowledge to solve the problems of today. Next time you read about a new life altering technology like gene editing or stem cell therapy, think about whether you or your neighbors can afford that new technology and why or why not. That will help you conduct your own research about why technology is made and who can and cannot afford it. Now, I'd like to hand it off back to Saba to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Elian. Now that we have an introductory understanding of some of, of some of the relevant concepts and how they relate to our faith, let's meet our speaker for today. Dr. Lilani has over nine years of experience doing research in the fields of immunology and oncology. He has published his research findings in several top tier scientific journals and presented his work at scientific conferences, including American Association of Immunologists. He has helped in the development of new cutting edge cancer treatments, including T cell therapy and antibody cytokine fusion therapy, which are both undergoing clinical testing. Dr. Lalani has a bachelor's degree in biotechnology from Kennesaw State University and a PhD deg degree in pharmacology from Rutgers University. He also did a postdoctoral fellowship at National Cancer Institute. Dr. Lalani currently is a senior associate scientist at Amgen, where he works on developing the next generation of immunotherapies for the treatment of advanced and metastatic cancers. I would like to encourage our audience to ask questions throughout the session. You can do that by using the Q&A feature on Zoom and entering your question there. Our team will be noting the questions to be asked during the Q&A session towards the end. And now without further ado, our guest speaker, Almin Lalani will speak to us about his career path, new opportunities within his field and how this field will evolve in the future. With that, I would like to hand it off to Almin. Thank you, Sabah, for your kind introduction. Yeah, um, Linda, there, everyone. <clears throat> First of all, let me thank our kind education board, um, IPN, and ISN 
for giving me this opportunity to speak um, for this series. And I'm actually very excited to present this uh, uh, talk here and give some of you who are still undecided about what career path to choose um, some options, uh, hopefully some that you might not have considered or thought, oh, maybe I could do that, maybe I could do that, you know. So I hope you have that moment and I hope you, are, you find something that you want to do, find out more about. And um, I do have my contact details on this slide. So feel free to reach out to me after the talk if you have questions or need advice on anything that I'm going to present today. Okay. So this is the agenda. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction to biomedical sciences, uh, followed by my career path, and then present a biomedical scientist as a career option, along with some non-research-based careers um, available in biotech. And then close the talk by talking about some promising technologies, some challenges that we are facing in the field and some closing thoughts. Okay, so what is biomedical science? It is a very broad term. Um, basically, it is a group of sciences that focuses on understanding the biology, the basic biology of human body and human diseases. And this, um, this group of sciences forms the basis for biotechnology, um, which is another term that you might have come across um, in the news or um, during your studies. So what biotechnology does is it uses this knowledge base created by biomedical sciences to make useful products um, like pharmaceuticals. And as you see in this definition, it could also include like pest resistant crops. So biotechnology is, is broader. It's not just focused on human medicines. It can be applied to a lot of other areas as well. Um, but the, the connection between biomedical science and biotechnology here is that the focus of biomedical science is mainly on human diseases and that feeds into creating new products for the treatment of human diseases via biotechnology. So you can think of biomedical science as a multidisciplinary field. <clears throat> And because of that, there are a lot of uh, options to choose from when it comes to choosing a major um, in undergrad or grad school. So usually some of the majors that are available as options to choose from are listed under life sciences or physical sciences. And some of those options include biology or cell and developmental biology pharmacology, which is the, um, which studies how the drugs that or medicines that you take affects your body or what does the body do to those drugs, uh, microbiology and infectious diseases, immunology, biochem, cancer biology, structure biology. So as you can see, you know, there are a lot of different options to choose from. And then um, if you are like, planning to go to grad school and do a like a PhD or something, then you will also come across something called interdisciplinary options. So what that means is you will see options like biomedical engineering, uh, computational biology, what, what that means. Um, so that combines two fields into one. So for example, biomedical sciences, you are, uh, I mean, biomedical engineering, you are applying engineering principles um, to understand biology and medicine. And so these folks end up uh, making like diagnostic devices and equipments that are uh, you, often, you often see in hospitals. And then there is also something called computational biology or bioinformatics, which is currently a very hot a field to be in, and I will talk about it a little bit more like towards the end of my presentation. But basically this is a, a marriage of computer science with biology. 
So if you are someone who's interested in like applying artificial intelligence, machine learning, so on and so forth, but also interested in biology, then you could kind of merge these two together and become a, an expert in computational biology. Then you have biostatistics, which merges these um, statistics with biology. And these are the folks that are um, doing like a lot of uh, number crunching and they play a key role in clinical research and clinical trials. And then there is biophysics, which uh, merges the physical aspects of the biology. I mean, with the biology. So you, you're learning about like structures, uh, high or, higher order structures and everything. Um, so basically my point is that you are not restricted to like one area or one field here. Um, you should think of these majors as like a starting point, especially if you are an undergrad. Um, and, and what you will see is that a lot of these majors, they have almost similar requirements to graduate with maybe two or three courses here and there that, that are different. Um, and so if you did like a bachelor's in immunology, doesn't mean that you cannot switch to biomedical engineering later on if you decide to, you, can, you very well can. Um, so that is the beauty of biomedical sciences. There are no boundaries here and there is a lot of cross-pollination between majors. <laughs> And if you want to uh, find more information, then I have a couple of links down here. Um, you can go through them and, and learn more about what are the, some of the undergrad majors that you can take, as well as uh, some grad school majors that you can take uh, for a career in biomedical sciences. All right, so with so many majors to choose from, you also get a lot of career options to choose from. Um, and so I have listed here a few. This is definitely not a comprehensive list, but some of these are expected to grow in the next 10 years. Um, and you can also find out more about these majors at DLS, which is the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it gives you more details on, okay, what does this uh, a biomedical engineer do, and what is the salary, and what is the outlook, so on and so forth. But just to give you guys a, a, a flavor of some of the uh, careers in biomedical sciences, the one of the popular options still remains is a tenure track professor or principal investigator. <clears throat> so these are the professors that you would uh, see at research universities. And although this is a popular option, I have to say that it is one of the most difficult positions to get in biomedical sciences because it comes with a lot of perks. So you get like job security plus freedom to pursue any kind of research that you like. And so that brings a lot of competition as well as um, the number of positions in this area hasn't been keeping up with the number of PhD graduates or postdoctoral um, fellows coming out of academia. So if, uh, if you are considering this option, be prepared for some fierce competition uh, but it is a very popular option that remains in for PhD uh, uh, students or scientists. Next option I have here is biomedical scientist, which is something that I do. And um, basically these are scientists that do a lot of uh, hands-on research and publish their findings. The numbers in the brackets are the the percent uh, growth projections from DLS in the next 10 years. And a, next is a biomedical engineer, um, which I kind of briefly introduced in the previous slide. 
it's they combine engineering principles with sciences to design and create equipment and medical devices which includes a lot of like diagnostic devices and then we have microbiologists um, who study microorganisms like bacteria viruses fungi and a lot of these also specialize in uh, infectious diseases that are caused by these microorganisms and then there is this uh, field of clinical research and uh, a popular entry level position is a clinical research associate. Um, so what these folks do is they make sure that clinical trials are conducted as per the protocol. Uh, the, uh, the investigational sites or whoever is conducting the trial is following all the steps that are approved by FDA and so on and so forth. And then if you are someone who is uh, very much interested in writing, but also love biology or medicine, then you could become a medical writer um, and you would be the one compiling, writing, editing, scientific and medical documents. A lot of these documents are submitted to FDA or like published in journals. And then if you are someone who enjoys chemistry, but also wants to stay involved in medicine or biology, then you could become a medicinal chemist. And these are the people who, who synthesize drugs. Uh, they make chemicals and compounds that are used to develop the helpful medicines. And of course, this is, there are a lot more options, uh, uh, a lot more career options. So I would um, encourage you to explore and could start by using these couple of links down here, but um, obviously there are a lot more to choose from. Okay, so what are some places that you could be employed at? <clears throat> uh, one of the options is research universities. So a lot of those uh, tenure track professor and uh, uh, similar positions are employed at uh, research universities. <clears throat> And I've listed an example of a few here. This is again, not a comprehensive list, um, but some of the other options available at research universities nowadays, since the tenure track positions are not, the, those numbers are not that high. You could, if you're interested in teaching, then you could become something called adjunct professor or lecturers, which are, uh, somewhat of temporary positions, but they, they are more heavy on teaching and usually they don't come with any research responsibilities. And then we have cancer centers. Um, these are dedicated for to treatment of cancer and mostly see cancer patients. <clears throat> Some of the famous ones that you might have heard of are like MD Anderson in Texas, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, City of Hope in California. Then NIH, which is uh, probably a term that you have heard in the news because they're heavily involved in COVID response and vaccine development. They have a cancer center as well. And so these are the centers that employ uh, a lot of PhD students, postdoctoral students, and also they employ some of the professors. Um, some of them prefer not to teach, so they would uh, apply to cancer centers and just conduct research. And then I guess big chunk of the uh, graduates of biomedical sciences are employed in the industry, uh, which comprises of pharma and biotech companies. <clears throat> And that includes some of the big names like Amgen, Merck, Novartis, but also some of these smaller companies like Moderna, BioNTech, uh, CRISPR. And you might have heard of some of these companies because they are the ones who developed the current COVID-19 vaccines that we are getting. And obviously there are a lot more options to choose from. Um, this is just to give you a flavor of 
okay, so these are some of the places that I could get employed if I'm if I have a degree in biomedical science. Okay, so what was my career path um, to becoming a scientist? <clears throat> so I did my high school in uh, Hyderabad, India, and in India we call it junior college, and we have to choose a concentration early on in high school. Um, so I ended up choosing biology, physics, and chemistry. Um, you guys are lucky that you don't have to do that in US or some of the other countries. Um, but luckily I, I knew what I wanted to do. So I was comfortable choosing biology, physics, and chemistry. Then I moved to United States uh, where I decided to pursue an associate of arts in biology at a community college. <clears throat> and so my reason for doing this was because I was an international student. So um, I found community college to be a good route to kind of save some money as well as uh, get all the prereqs that I could eventually get it transferred to a four-year university. And that is exactly what I did. I, um, I was able to get a, get an associates from the community college and then get pretty much all the credits transferred to the bachelor's program at Kennesaw State. And there I spent about two and a half years to get my bachelor's degree. And I, I already had uh, developed an interest in biotechnology. So I also did a certificate program in biotechnology, um, which kind of helped me understand more about what is biotechnology and what are some of the options for me. <clears throat> So next, during my bachelor's, I learned that um, I could pursue something called a PhD and become a scientist. And it was a path that I explored and I thought hmm, this is a good option. So I went to Rutgers uh, to pursue a PhD in pharmacology, which was about five and a half years long. And then went to National Cancer Institute which is part of NIH to pursue a postdoctoral fellowship. So postdoctoral fellowship is something similar, equivalent to a residency after an MD. So here you are basically like an independent scientist um, doing your own research, but you're still kind of under the guidance of your uh, principal investigator. And then currently I'm a senior associate scientist at Amgen and I use my training uh, from NIH as well as Rutgers to do what I do at Amgen. And I will go over some of the details of exactly what I did um, during my scientific career, just, as, just so that you guys get an idea of what is it like to be a scientist and if that is an uh, option for you or not. Okay, so I wanna quickly point out some similarities and some differences between the scientific track versus becoming a physician. I know this is a popular option um, in bachelors. I mean, I was uh, aspiring to become a physician because I didn't know I could become a scientist. I wasn't even aware of this uh, option until my physics professor told me hey, you could apply to grad school. I was like, oh, really, tell me more, right? Anyway, um, so the undergraduate training for both the tracks is kind of very similar. Um, you could do a bachelor's in biological sciences, physical sciences, math, statistics, or something related. And the same would work uh, if you are trying to go to uh, medical school, uh, but then you would also have to satisfy some of the pre-med requirements. In terms of the graduate degree, for the scientific track, uh, majority of us would come in with a PhD and uh, 
you have a lot of options to choose from, which I went over earlier, and there are a few more. Every school has different programs, so uh, you should explore a lot of different schools. <clears throat> and a fun fact about PhD in the United States is that you do not need a master's degree to get into a PhD program in US. Now, uh, this might not be true in some of the other countries um, because they might ask you for a master's degree, but in US, at least you do not need a master's. <clears throat> and the average time for a PhD is about five to six years. For uh, becoming a physician, you either get an MD or a doctor of osteopathic medicine. Uh, and the average time is about four years. Uh, the biggest difference I would say is the cost of school um, for PhD program. It's usually free of cost, meaning that you get a full waiver of tuition. Um, and on top of that, you get a stipend. <clears throat> and that stipend will basically take care of your living expenses. Um, on the other hand, um, you guys are probably aware med school is expensive. The average cost is about 150 to 260K for four years. And you have to um, take care of your living expenses as well. <clears throat> um, and then after your grad school or med school, you have the option to do postdoctoral fellowship. Now, this is not a requirement, but based on your goals, um, what do you want to do? Like if you want to become a professor or take a, uh, do like hardcore research, then you are more than likely required to do a postdoctoral fellowship. But if you feel like PhD was enough for you and you want to explore like non-research based options after your PhD, then you don't necessarily have to do a postdoctoral fellowship. You could go into a lot of other areas and uh, without a postdoctoral fellowship and you will still be highly successful. Uh, <clears throat> for uh, med school, I mean, right after med school, you're expected to do a residency and also a fellowship if you want to become a specialist. <clears throat> um, obviously these two are <clears throat> not exactly similar uh, physicians would definitely be more involved uh, in dealing with patients whereas a scientist is more involved in doing research in the lab and creating medicines and drugs <clears throat> that are then used by the physicians to dispense to the or prescribe to the patients <clears throat> so these are different routes but i just wanted to point out some um, alternative options for you or just so that you know, okay, I have this option as well. I don't necessarily have to go to med school or vice versa. I don't have to become a scientist. I could be a physician. Another thing I would uh, note here is that if you have an MD, you have the option of becoming a scientist. We do have a lot of physician scientists. <clears throat> um, Usually they end up doing like a postdoctoral fellowship to get exposure to lab-based research and then they continue uh, being a physician and a scientist. But if you get a PhD, you don't have the option of going on the clinical side unless you also get an MD. <clears throat> so that is the advantage of getting an MD. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so what are some of the things that help me um, stay competitive and get a leg up on my uh, competition? <clears throat> During my undergrad, I um, spent two semesters doing research in a microbiology lab uh, because I wanted to get a taste of uh, what it feels like to do research. And also I knew that getting some research experience would help me um, get into med school or grad school <clears throat> because I was still undecided what I wanted to do. <clears throat> um, and then as part of the, um, the certificate program in biotechnology, I also ended up doing an internship at an investigational site. 
what this site does is basically all those patients that enroll in a clinical trial, they would come to an investigational site to get their drug or the placebo. Um, and so basically they are the ones conducting the clinical trial. So this is where I got exposure to clinical side of things and clinical research. <clears throat> And then during my PhD, um, I had already developed an interest in going into pharma and biotech. So I really wanted to do an internship to see how it really feels to be in the industry. And it was through networking and attending a lot of career sessions and keeping in touch with the panelists that I was able to secure an internship at Novartis. And that gave me some really good exposure and understanding of, okay, there are so many options that I could pursue in pharma. Um, it doesn't have to be just research. <clears throat> and then I was also doing a uh, program during my PhD that, that would enhance my soft skills and interviewing skills, um, help me create a really good resume and so on and so forth. <clears throat> So after my PhD, during my postdoctoral uh, training, I continued to attend a lot of career sessions and networking events. And I was uh, doing something called informational interviewing, which I think is a very critical and the most useful skill for you guys to learn. If you are um, an undergrad or a high schooler, no matter what, if you can learn this skill, this will help you. You might not ever have to apply for a job if you are really good at conducting these informational interviews. So what are these? These are basically, you choose a, a few experts in the field that you see yourself in their shoes uh, when you graduate. And so you basically conduct an interview of them, asking them questions like, okay, please walk me through your career path. Um, do you have an advice on what I should be doing now to get a position at your company? Uh, what is it like to work in your position and so on and so forth, right? Um, so that gives you uh, an insight into a job or a career path that you are interested in. <clears throat> and I would encourage you to uh, Go to this link here and read more about this uh, informational interviewing. It, there's a really nice article there and it breaks it down for you exactly what it means and what you should be doing. Okay, so what are some of the skills that would help you succeed in this field? <clears throat> you, you obviously need some strong technical skills if you want to pursue like research and be a scientist because it involves a lot of hands-on work. And then <clears throat> you would need something called critical thinking. So what that means is when you see some data, do you believe it right away or you, or you tell yourself, hmm, do I really believe this data? Did, did they do the experiment right? Did they have the right controls? Um, are there any gaps in this study? So, you know, you critique the data. You don't just take everything that's given to you. Um, and if you have an inquisitive mindset, are you curious about um, how things work? And if this gene does that, can it also do this, <clears throat> right? If you're always asking yourself um, those questions, then <clears throat> this would be, this field would be a good fit. <clears throat> Uh, problem solving is pretty self-explanatory. Attention to detail is important. Um, enjoying reading. Uh, so what that means is <clears throat> a lot of these positions can get technical and you will end up reading a lot of technical literature, right? Uh, and this is uh, required or encouraged because uh, first, you have to like stay up to date with the latest findings in the field. And secondly, a lot of the things that are published, you could actually end up using in your own research and it will 
uh, maybe if you use that new technique that was published, it will maybe enhance or then fast forward your research uh, rapidly as compared to just sticking with your own method of doing things. So it helps to stay up to date um, with the recent literature in the field. Now, a lot of you might be thinking, I don't have a lot of these skills. I have maybe one or two. So is this not an option? Um, absolutely not. A lot of these skills you will develop during your educational training or your PhD, postdoc, whatever you pursue. Um, so don't worry about it. You will be well prepared, <clears throat> especially if you have, if you do a lot of these extracurricular activities and pursue research opportunities during your educational training, <clears throat> then you will develop a lot of these skills. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. So for those of you who are <clears throat> interested in research as a career, <clears throat> I would like to go into more details about what I do and <clears throat> just to give you a flavor of some of the things that you could be doing as a scientist. <clears throat> but before that, I wanna uh, give a quick overview of the immune system because this will help you understand some of the later slides. And also, I guess we are still in the middle of the pandemic. We are still not uh, done with it. So it would be nice to have a basic understanding of the immune system and how COVID works and how the vaccines are working, so on and so forth. <clears throat> okay, so the immune system can be broadly divided into two parts, innate and adaptive. The innate is also called as natural or <clears throat> natural immunity uh, because this is something that you naturally have. But this side is also called as acquired immunity because this is something that you will acquire once you see like a new virus or if you have a cancer, then you get immunity to that. So it's, this is the adaptive or the acquired immunity. And it is broadly divided based on the cells that are involved in each phase of the immune response. <clears throat> so I will use the um, I'll use a virus here. It's a picture of a coronavirus. Uh, we are very familiar with it because uh, you know we are still in the middle of the pandemic. <clears throat> so uh, when a virus like coronavirus invades the your body the first line of defense is your innate immune system. And that is comprised of epithelial barriers. This could be like your nasal lining, gut lining, um, the respiratory tract, tract lining, so on and so forth. But the virus is usually able to breach this layer. And then it is um, it comes across some of these other cells, which are broadly termed as myeloid cells. And I have highlighted these cells because my PhD is focused on these cells. So what these cells do is they basically chop up the wires and then they present it to this side of the, the equation where you have these T cells that are leading for these myeloid cells. So basically a handshake needs to happen between <clears throat> these cells and the T cells <clears throat> where the myeloid cells will kind of give a license to T cells to go and kill the enemy. And so these are like your highly trained soldiers in your body, um, which are really good at killing. And we actually call them killer T cells. <clears throat> And so once these are activated, um, what they do is they pass the license to B cells and B cells are like, sure, I can help you get rid of this virus. They start to multiply and they start making <clears throat> lots of antibodies, uh, which are basically like uh, precise bullets, which will go and bind to the target. And <clears throat> in this example, the target is a virus. So once this side is activated, uh, <clears throat> it will go and kill the virus or 
it will end up killing the tumor. So the tumor goes through the same response. Tumor is basically a, a cell that is gone rogue and it starts to divide uncontrollably and develops into a mass of cells and eventually a tumor. Uh, so the immune system will treat these cells as something foreign that does not belong to you and to start attacking. <clears throat> Um, and so, as you notice here, like this phase is where it kicks on very early on. It's within a few hours. And this phase takes a few days to develop. That's why it, it takes time for your body to clear the infection, usually about one or two weeks. And the way vaccines work is um, what scientists do is instead of giving you the virus, they take a small part of this virus and inject that and they trick your body into believing that it is under attack by the actual virus. So the body goes through the whole process and develops immunity towards this virus. Uh, so when you actually get infected, it gets cleared very rapidly because now your system has memory of this virus and you are immune to it. <clears throat> okay. So this is a quick crash course on the immune system and you got excited learning about it and want to pursue research. Then I'll show you what scientists do on a daily basis. But if you are, if you are in the other group and you're like, this is cool, but I don't really want to pursue research-based careers, then I will have more options for you later on. So stay tuned. Okay, what does a scientist really do? Uh, we follow something called a literature, I mean, hypothesis-driven research. And this is the flow chart for that. Basically, you start with some background research, uh, ask a question, create a hypothesis, test that hypothesis, analyze the data, and then communicate your, your results. And in real life, this is what it looks like. Um, so during my PhD, I was interested in learning more about this protein called TRAF3. Um, what was the background knowledge we had? We knew that it has different roles in T cells and B cells, but we didn't know what, what was its role in myeloid cells. So now you're aware of these three cell types from previous slide. <laughs> so we made a hypothesis uh, maybe it also has a different role in myeloid cells. Cool. So let's design an experiment. We generated a mouse model so that we could understand more about TRAF3 in myeloid cells. <clears throat> okay. Then we had to figure out if the experiment was working properly. So we did that and we made sure that, yes, it was working properly. The, the model looked good. And then we analyzed the data. The data showed that TRAF3 plays an important role in inflammation and cancer. So that was a very important finding. Uh, and we were excited that, okay, we found the role of TRAF3 in myeloid cells. <clears throat> um, did the results align with our hypothesis? Yes, it did. Um, it was, the role was slightly different from its role in T and B cells. So it did align with our hypothesis. And then we communicated this results by publishing in a journal. And so that's what, that's what um, hypothesis driven research looks like. And this research is called basic research because the goal here is to understand the basic biology of either a gene or a pathway or a disease. But then there's something called translational research. And what this means is that you take the findings of basic research and then translate it into the clinic so that now it can actually help the patients or can be used to treat human diseases. So what does that look like? Uh, so during my postdoctoral work, I did something called translational research. The background knowledge that we had was T cells, which now you're all aware of, they have the ability to recognize and destroy tumor cells. 
Okay, so we hypothesized maybe we can use these T cells to treat cancer patients. Sure, let's design a, a test. So clinical trials were designed um, to isolate, expand, and transfer these T cells back to the same patient. So what we do is, this is the cancer patient. We remove the tumor and then grow out these cells called T cells using some special media. And then once they are, once we have like billions of these cells, we give it back to the same patient. And then we see, um, did it help with the tumor? Does it suppress it? Does it get rid of it? What happens, right? And so the results were, yes, we can successfully treat some patients, but then there are some that do not respond or some that respond, but the cancer comes back. So, you know, you get like, okay, we get responders, non-responders, and then you can learn more about, okay, what, what went right, what went wrong, so on and so forth. So that is translational research. <clears throat> and then I wanna point out that this type of therapy is called personalized therapy or autologous therapy. And I will come to the other type of therapy called off the shelf therapy, which is where the field is moving to. Because as you can imagine, this is a highly personal treatment, right? It's, it's like uh, designing a custom suit for every single patient. And as you, as you are aware, you know, having a tailored suit would be a lot more expensive compared to like a mass produced suit. And so the same logic goes with this type of therapy. Okay. And so what does research look like at a biotech company um, like Amgen? So I continue to do translational as well as basic research here. So all of my training at Rutgers and at NCI has helped me to perform the function that I do now. And my goal is to uh, produce new therapies that are more effective and less toxic than the current therapies. And I have kind of helped in development of one of such therapies, uh, which is like a fusion of uh, anti-PD-1 therapy and IL-21. So anti-PD-1 is a therapy that releases the brakes on T cells and basically helps them um, kill the tumor cell more efficiently. But then, you know, it works in some patients and it doesn't in others. So we decided to give it some superpowers by adding a cytokine, which is another type of protein. And so now we are trying to see in the clinic, does this help? Does these new T cells with new superpowers, are they able to do a better job at killing the tumor or not? And then I also continue doing basic research uh, because we also want to understand okay, how this therapy is affecting the healthy tissue. Is it, are there side effects or you know, what can we do to avoid the side effects? Um, and then I also continue to identify new targets so that we can uh, design new therapies and see if we can uh, tackle the tumor in a different way, using a different pathway, something like that. Okay, and so what is a typical week for me? Um, I spend a lot of my time in the lab doing experiments and generating data, um, and then spend about 10 to 20% of my time doing data analysis, which is then converted into presentations. And I present these internally, sometimes externally, and some of my time also goes in meetings and some of my time goes in literature research so that I could stay up to date with some of the findings in the field and see if I could use some of those findings uh, in my own work. Okay, so for those, who we're not really excited about doing research or are excited to stay in biology and medicine, but then 
would like to explore other aspects uh, like business or management. So are there options for you? Yes, definitely there are options for you in biotech and pharma. Uh, <clears throat> but before I present those, let me walk you through the drug development process uh, very quickly. Um, and as you see here, the basic research that I mentioned in the earlier slides, it basically forms the foundation of drug development process. So this is our knowledge base. And we use this using translational research to convert into therapies. And so the next stage here is non-clinical studies. These are some of the studies that we do in animals or in, in petri dishes to make sure that one, the therapy is working, two, it is not toxic, um, three, it is going to be useful to the patient. We do a lot of different tests before we even move into humans for clinical testing. And then this is the longest and the most expensive phase of drug, drug development. Uh, and a lot of you must be aware of phase one, phase two, phase three, because that's what the COVID vaccines went through. And then the uh, regulatory agencies approve the drug. Mostly it's the, it is FDA in US and there are others in other countries. And once the drug is approved, it is launched. And then there is a post-marketing study as well. <clears throat> So what are some of the options uh, in this process? Uh, you could work in something called process development or biomanufacturing. What this means is once we have one or two lead molecules, we need to scale up the production of these drugs so that we could now test it in thousands of patients mm -hmm. instead of performing our small scale test in the lab these needs to be tested in thousands of patients in the clinic. <clears throat> and so these are the specialists that we rely on who will scale up the process and make sure everything is in place so that we have enough product to do the clinical testing. <clears throat> and then if you're someone who is interested in management type of roles, then um, there are lots of projects going on at this stage and even at this stage, and you need these managers to manage not only the business side of things, but also the projects um, to keep us on the timeline, make sure we are meeting the deadlines. And so that's, that's where these folks come in. <clears throat> then there is a huge field on regulatory affairs. Uh, which are the folks that are involved in filing a lot of paperwork to FDA or IRB and other agencies. Uh, there's tons of paperwork that needs to be submitted, um, uh, data that needs to be submitted to FDA. So these are the folks that uh, would help you do that. Clinical research um, is, are the people who are doing the, conducting the actual clinical studies, making sure the physicians are aware of what, what drugs to administer and what patients to recruit in the, in the protocol and so on and so forth. <clears throat> quality assurance, make sure that the drug product is of highest quality, there is no contamination, it meets the standards, stuff like that. <clears throat> And then you will have, once the drug is ready to be approved, uh, you need your sales and technical support team um, to kind of market the product and make sure that it is going to reach as many clinics and doctor's offices and patients as possible. Um, there's a product strategy and commercialization team that designs a strategy of how they will uh, advertise the product to different physicians, educate them um, so that they are aware that there is this new drug that is coming out in the market that they can prescribe to the patients, which is better than what is currently available. So, and so before I leave this slide, uh, there are some facts that I would like to uh, leave you guys with. 
which is that the average cost of drug development is about $2.6 billion per drug, which is huge. And the average time is 12 to 16 years with a failure rate of, of about 96%. <clears throat> so the reason why I present these facts is that a um, lot of the general public is aware that the prices of drugs are so high, but then they're not aware of why they're so high. This is one of the reasons why it is high. Obviously, there are other reasons that also bring up the prices of the drugs. But then these are also some of the problems that are facing the industry because, of course, this is a, a topic of discussion where there are a lot of patients that cannot afford these drugs. So what I want you guys to think of is while you are uh, getting your degrees in undergrad or grad school, I want you to think of these problems in the, in the field and see what can you do to come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. So what the pandemic has taught us is that maybe the clinical studies doesn't have to take three to seven years. Maybe we could cut short and uh, get an approval in two years or three years, right? Uh, <clears throat> or maybe <clears throat> we could do something else to reduce the cost. So there, you know, you could think of all of these options um, and solutions. Um, so that's where, that's where uh, the opportunities are uh, for innovation. <clears throat> okay, so next I would like to talk about some of the innovative technologies in the field. Um, but before we do that, we would like to do a quick poll. Uh, a knowledge check about what is CRISPR. And we just want to know if, if you guys are aware of what is CRISPR. Okay, excellent. Um, I see that the poll is closed. I'm glad that a lot of you chose gene editing technology and yes, that is the correct uh, answer, uh, but also the correct answer is that it is also a type of immune system. Okay, I will keep going. So just a quick shout out to the inventors of CRISPR. Um, so they received the Nobel Prize last year. So they are Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. And you can learn more about them. Um, what I would like to do uh, to introduce CRISPR is to play a short video so that you guys are aware of what this technology means. And then I'll CRISPR talk about CRISPR-Cas is the a powerful new technology that is revolutionizing biology. It's like cut and paste for DNA. 
Using CRISPR-Cas, or CRISPR for short, scientists can delete, tweak, or completely replace the genes of any organism. And they can do it more cheaply, easily, and efficiently than ever before. Researchers are already trying to use CRISPR to introduce genes for disease resistance into wheat, insert malaria-blocking genes into mosquitoes, and remove HIV genes from infected cells in humans. Scientists didn't design CRISPR themselves. Instead, they borrowed it from microbes, like bacteria and archaea. These microorganisms use the CRISPR system as a defence mechanism against invading parasites like viruses. It works like this. When a virus attacks a bacterium, it introduces its own DNA into the cell. DNA contains the instructions for life. It's made up of four different chemical units, which the cell reads like a code. Some viruses use their DNA to hijack the bacterium's cellular machinery and make more copies of themselves. They eventually burst out of the cell and spread to other bacteria. But with CRISPR-Cas, the bacterium can fight back. The Cas part of CRISPR-Cas is an enzyme that works like molecular scissors. The bacterium uses Cas to cut the invading DNA into two, disabling the virus. Next, the bacterium inserts a section of the intruder viral DNA into a special area of its own genome. Over time, the bacterium uses this area to build up a library of bad guys. It forms a kind of parasite hit list so that it can recognise them if they attack again in the future. The bacterium copies these sequences into related molecules called RNA. Each RNA guide is combined with a Cas enzyme, turning the molecular scissors into precise targeted weapons. Now, when they encounter a piece of DNA inside the cell that matches the sequence on the guide, Cas will snip the intruder DNA and disable it. Before we discovered CRISPR, we thought that the immune systems of bacteria were simple, crude tools that worked for everything. But now we know their defences are much more sophisticated. CRISPR-Cas forms what's known as an adaptive immune system, much like our own. With it, the bacteria can form immune memories of invaders and respond more quickly and precisely if they attack in the future. All right, so I will stop there and then I will so hope that makes sense. Uh, CRISPR is uh, uh, ancient immune system used by bacteria, and then it was um, repurposed by scientists so that it could also be used as a gene editing tool. And I would like to discuss some of the applications of uh, CRISPR. So it can be broadly divided into two different types. Uh, it's it's used on the experimental research side, but then also on the human therapeutic side. So some of the applications on the research side are, <clears throat> it can be used for genomic studies um, to understand chromosomal translocations and uh, stuff like that. Can be used to generate new disease models, uh, which are used uh, in preclinical testing. And then it can also be used for new target identification and drug discovery. Um, so instead of knocking out one gene, you could knock out 20,000 genes and then screen for cells that have the properties that you're looking for. <clears throat> On the clinical side of things, you could tackle uh, monogenic diseases. So basically these are single gene diseases that have a mutation and leads to uh, an abnormality. And one of the example includes uh, sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. So several patients were uh, treated last year, or I believe in 2019 in a phase one clinical trial. And two of those patients were featured in an NPR article. <clears throat> and they're basically, they have been cured of their sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. So it's, um, it looks very promising in the early uh, phases of clinical testing. It can be used for HIV, um, where you could manipulate a gene that is used by HIV and then give those cells back to the patient and see if they are uh, immune to HIV infection. Um, with 
some of the new uh, functions of CRISPR emerging, you, uh, it is being used to study if it can directly attack the flu virus and COVID-19 virus so that um, they are unable to carry on with their infection. And in the cancer field, it is being used uh, to edit some of the immune cells like T cells and give it back to the cancer patients and see if that enhances their function. So these are some of the applications of CRISPR. Um, next technology I have is a stem cell, which is also a pretty hot field. So just a brief intro on what stem cells are. They need to have two characteristics. One is that they self-renew, that is they can copy and make a lot of copies of themselves um, uh, without dying. And if given proper signals, they can differentiate into specialized cells. So like the T and B cells are specialized cells. They are not stem cells. Mm -hmm. And then there are three types of stem cells. Every tissue in your body has stem cells that can replenish those um, cells. So for example, the bone marrow has stem cells to replenish the blood cells. And then the embryos have stem cells, which eventually develop into the full grown adult that, that we, are, we are. And so these cells have the capacity to assume a lot of different roles and become like a muscle cell or a nerve cell. And then there's something called induced pluripotent stem cells, which are, which are basically, we start from here, like a T cell or muscle cell, and then <clears throat> we bring it back to a stem cell um, by adding some uh, chemicals and uh, activating some of the genes um, so that it starts behaving like a stem cell. And then you could use these stem cells to for several applications. Some of those applications are include regenerative medicine where you could uh, regenerate like neurons in Parkinson's, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease or regenerate heart muscles after a heart injury. Or like in diabetes where um, the pancreatic cells are attacked, you could regenerate those cells to get rid of diabetes. And in cancer, uh, the recent efforts are into creating something called off-the-shelf therapies. So as opposed to personalized therapies that I uh, talked about earlier, the field is moving towards off-the-shelf therapies. So these are like buying a suit off the shelf of a store rather than going to a tailor and designing a therapy or a suit. Um, so here what happens is we take the T cells that we are interested in and we convert them into um, stem cells. And then these cells can be used to put back into the patient because now these are younger cells and they have the capacity to grow a lot more than the cells that we started with. Then another technology is called next generation sequencing. So this is basically a DNA RNA sequencing technology and uh, the reason why we need this technology is, is because cancer uh, is a disease that is made from mutations. And what that means is, so the central dogma of biology is that information flows from DNA to RNA and protein. Um, but then uh, a mutation can happen in the DNA, which could lead to a mutation in RNA and can give rise to a, a different protein or affect the function of that protein. On the other hand, a mutation can happen somewhere else where it could lead to a lot of that protein or very little of that protein. So some of these situations could lead to the development of cancer and other diseases. So what next generation sequencing helps you do is it helps you identify these mutations um, so that we can design better therapies. And so currently we are using the second generation uh, of sequencing technologies, which are like several fold faster than first generation technology. And we are slowly moving into the third generation of sequencing technologies. And so all that 
um, leads to the concept of precision medicine. Um, so what this means is that this is an approach um, to care for the patients um, by selecting treatments that are most likely to help patients based on the genetic understanding of their disease. Um, so what that means is the traditional approach that we had was uh, using radiation, chemotherapy, or surgery, which are not very specific to the patient's uh, tumor cell, but rather it, it will go and kill any dividing cell. Um, so once we understand the genetic makeup of that of the tumor or any other disease, by sequencing, we can identify some of these uh, cell therapies or immunotherapies, um, and we can design some targeted therapies that are more than likely to um, help the patient rather than uh, be negatively uh, affected by the therapy. All right, so uh, obviously there are lots of challenges uh, in this field. Um, and some of the challenges uh, related to cancer and immune oncology is that it's a, it's a complex disease. It's essentially a group of diseases. So um, learning about one type of cancer doesn't necessarily apply to all types of cancer. And it's a, it's a ever evolving disease. So there are lots of resistance mechanisms um, and it evades the treatments and the immune system. Uh, quickly. There's a lot of diversity within a tumor. Um, even within one single tumor, there are a lot of different cells. So one few cells will respond, but then the other is one, and that's how you, you get the cancer back. And as you notice, the drug development process is lengthy and costly, and so therefore the progress is slow. Um, and personalized medicine is good. It sounds good, but it could be cost prohibitive uh, because now the, the therapies are tailored towards specific patients. So we need to come up with solutions uh, to lower the cost of uh, therapies. Um, uh, one of the solutions could be that we need a multidisciplinary, multimodality, combinatorial approach um, to tackle a disease like cancer. <clears throat> and this is a, a challenge and opportunity in itself because um, it is a challenge to bring a lot of different people and disciplines and departments together, but then we, we know that this is how we will be able to cure this disease and a lot of other diseases. So a lot of progress is being made in this front where there's a lot of collaboration between departments and disciplines. Mm -hmm. And I want you to think of these as opportunities for improvement. Um, and so uh, there's always like room for innovation and new talent. So I hope that you will uh, consider a career in this field. <clears throat> okay, so some of the closing thoughts, why would you uh, pursue a career in biomedical sciences? Um, as you notice that some of your work could have a direct positive impact um, on patients. So it is a highly satisfying uh, field. Uh, there are a lot of options to choose from. You're not restricted to just research. You could do a lot of non-research based uh, careers. It uh, involves a lot of different disciplines or fields and the pay is pretty decent. Um, and so these are uh, some of the options. Uh, these are some of the reasons why you should uh, consider a career in biomedical sciences. <clears throat> And I've listed uh, a lot of the resources that uh, I talked about earlier and uh, a book that has been highly recommended to me by other uh, people in the field that I would also like to recommend to you for further reading. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you for your attention. I mean, thank you so much for sharing your field of the future with us today. I genuinely enjoyed hearing about how widespread this field is with so many opportunities. With that, I'll open the floor to questions. As I mentioned earlier, you may submit questions using the Q&A feature. 
We are running short on time, so we may not be able to get all the questions. If you have any more questions, please reach out to the Fields of the Future team or Dr. Delalani directly via email or LinkedIn. If you need to leave before Q&A, please complete this survey. Our first question comes from Kiran, who is starting biomedical engineering at Georgia Tech. She's intrigued by your research in immunotherapies at Amgen. Could you share some guidance on steps she can take on her educational and career journey to work or anything she can do to work in a similar field? Sure, so she's already pursuing biomedical engineering, you said, right? Yes. And it's that undergrad or graduate school? Uh, um, undergrad, I believe, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess so you are already uh, have a good start in the field. Uh, <clears throat> if you are interested in pursuing immunotherapy type of research, then I would highly recommend that you try and do an internship uh, at a company like Amgen or um, get some research experience at a lab that is actively involved in immunotherapy. This is a, a hot topic right now. So you should be able to find a lot of labs in academia that are currently doing research in this area. Um, and it's a good way to get exposure, learn more about, okay, um, what does it mean to do research in this area and would it be a good fit for you or not? So that's where I would start. And then <clears throat> you could um, <clears throat> always do like a PhD or something, uh, but you don't necessarily have to do a PhD. You could get an entry level position with a bachelor's or a master's, uh, spend some time in, um, in industry and then decide if you want to do a PhD or not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next question, specifically, do you have any guidance on finding an internship and when is the best time to find one? So if you are an undergrad, I would start looking around the third year of your school. Um, and if you are a grad student, then <clears throat> um, like anywhere around like one or two years before you're ready to graduate. Um, ideally, you want to convert that internship into a job offer. Um, so the closer you are to being able to take that job is better for you. And, and then also um, towards the end of your degree, you would have a little more knowledge about the field. So you might be able to contribute a uh, little more than if you... Uh, than if you were to join like in one in the first or second year of your school. <clears throat> and the tips would be to network, go and attend a lot of career sessions, talk to the panelists, um, ask a lot of questions to them, uh, stay in touch. Um, that's how I got my internship uh, during my PhD. Um, I stayed in touch with one of the panelists and then one day I told him, uh, I'm looking for an internship, let me know if there are any opportunities and that's how he reached out to me and I applied and that's how I got my internship. Uh, some of them are posted online, but most of them are through networking. Awesome, thank you. It's so interesting how one conversation can lead to so many opportunities. Um, our next question, how can high school students take initiative on their interest in this field and what steps would you recommend? <clears throat> So for high school students, uh, there are options uh, at companies like Amgen. You could do like a small rotation or something over the summer. Um, and I believe like uh, government agencies like NIH also gives you options to come and spend a summer in a lab at one of the laboratories at NIH. So look for those options online. Uh, uh, they might not be as uh, as many as like internships available for undergrads or grad students, 
but there are options for high schoolers to go and spend like a summer in a lab. On the other hand, if you know, like if you have friends and family who are in this field and you could ask to shadow them or uh, spend some time with them, just one or two days, uh, you could learn a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next question, as a nurse, what options are available for an attendee to enter biomedical research and clinical trials? Right, so as a nurse, you already have training that is relevant in the clinical side of things, right? <clears throat> so you could definitely get involved uh, in, in, the, um, in conducting clinical trials. So you would help out in scheduling the patients, administering some of the doses of like a vaccine or, or another therapy. Um, and you could look into investigational sites, which are the ones that do a lot of this clinical trial testing and maybe ask to volunteer there uh, or maybe you know see if they have a temporary open position or something like that, that could eventually turn into a permanent position. Uh, but then if you're interested in going into research, then you could um, pursue like a research-based uh, project in academia or while you are doing your nursing course, see if you can join a research lab and see if you can spend a semester there. Um, and, you know, I would recommend that you could just volunteer your time um, and figure out, uh, is this something that I like to do? Is it something that I would like to invest more time in? Uh, and if it's a yes, then you think of some of the programs that you could uh, go and attend uh, and see maybe you can get a degree um, so that you could convert to research side of things. Um, yeah, so that would be my advice. Awesome, thanks. Our next mm -hmm. question is regarding um, COVID-19 and the vaccine process. As you mentioned, the body is tricked into thinking it has COVID. Does this mean a portion of the virus is actually injected to, into our body and does this pose a risk? No, so <clears throat> a part of the virus, so basically it's a, the vaccine that we have is a mRNA based and it's, it's a, uh, part of the virus that can elicit the immune response. It's not the real virus. So it doesn't have any capacity to multiply inside your body and cause an infection. But it is just enough so that your immune system is activated and can go through all the steps and develop immunity so that when you do uh, get infected uh, or encounter the real virus, your body already has memory and is prepared and is able to kill the virus before it can even start the replication process. Um, so it is, it is very safe. There is no risk of infection from the virus. Thank you so much for going into mm -hmm. that. Um, with that, we are at our last questions. Do you have any parting thoughts or final comments for our attendees? Sure, I would say best thing for you guys is to try a lot of things. Uh, I know there are a lot of options these days. Um, the field is ever evolving and within each field, there are so many different options to pursue. You could do research, non-research, even within research, there are so many options, right? What do you choose? So I would recommend that you start by just trying new things. If you are an undergrad, then go and pursue um, research in a lab, uh, spend one or two years and figure out um, if that is something that you like or not. <clears throat> um, internships is definitely a really good way of learning more about a company or um, you know, enhancing your resume. It will definitely help you uh, have a leg up uh, over your competition. <clears throat> um, and then there are a lot of online courses and certificate programs that you can do. 
uh, if you're interested in bioinformatics or learning more about some of the uh, other technologies out there, then you could go to Coursera and uh, edX and some of these other websites that have free courses that you can learn from. So spend time online um, going through those courses, learning more about it. You don't necessarily have to take a class at your school and pay for it uh, if it is available online for free. So explore those options. Um, learn the informational interview skills, talk to people on LinkedIn, reach out to as many people as you can. That is the best way to learn more about the field that you are interested in. Thank you so much. Yes, I agree. You know, there's so many resources out there. Um, why not take advantage of those resources? Right. And with that, we are out of time for questions. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Lalani. Again, if we did not get a chance to touch on your question, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Lalani directly. Thank you all for attending today. I want to remind all of you that this last slide to stay home and save lives. Our institutions encourage you to stay home and to continue to practice physical distancing. Before we conclude our program, I would like to request everyone to complete a brief evaluation to let us know how we can improve our upcoming events. The link is on your screens along with the QR code. Additionally, for easier access, we have shared the link in the chat box. Please take a moment to complete it now. Once again, thank you all for joining us today. I hope to see you at our next event in two weeks with Jamil Joffer discussing cybersecurity. Thank you and Yali Madad.